Welcome to this week's episode of The Trading Bell. We are coming to you from Westlands. This is the financial capital for Kenya. And we are honored to be speaking to Mr. Kario Kingari. He is the Chief Executive Officer for Standard Chartered Bank, Kenya and East Africa. Such a pleasure to see you, sir. Nice to meet you. Looking good, you're in good shape. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, today we want to really get a sense of what to expect around the banking sector. Are, are banks going to survive this pandemic? They will, definitely they will. I think in terms of uh, what, what, what the measures we are putting into place yeah. and the support that you're getting from the regulator and the guidance and the guidelines that you're getting from the regulator, banks will definitely survive. It's right. important for them to do that. Amazing. All that coming up on the trading bell. But first, let's take a look at his profile. Kariuki is an accomplished career banker with over 23 years of retail banking experience. He earned his recognition through successfully transforming the consumer banking divisions of Standard Chartered Bank Kenya and Standard Chartered Regional Africa. A seasonal financial professional, he has held various senior leadership roles across the industry. Prior to his current role, he was the global head retail distribution for Standard Chartered Bank in Singapore. There, he was instrumental in formulating global strategies in building the future of retail branch and voice and virtual landscapes through digitization of the physical channels and revision of branch models and standards. Prior to his global role, Kariuki was the regional head of Retail Clients Africa between 2013 and 2015 and the executive director Kenya and East Africa from 2009 to 2013. He has also held senior positions in Barclays Bank of Kenya Limited. Thank you, sir, for making time for us here on the Trading Bell. Such an honor to be here. It's been a while. Thank you and welcome. All right. Walking in into the building, it's not the usual, the typical stand chart you'd find. Uh, the clutter of sh people walking, the sounds. Clearly, a good percentage of employees are working from home. And this is now the new normal that many organizations have to deal with. Just let's break the ice by giving us a sense of how you've been coping as a bank since COVID struck. The first thing that, uh, that we did as a bank uh, immediately, the first case was announced, probably a couple of weeks before, was to ask ourselves, how do we protect our employees? Because that's very, very important. It was yeah. our first priority is protecting our employees because unless the employees are safe, yeah. they will not be able to support clients and they will not be able to support business. And so the, one of the things is facilitated uh, employees to work from home, so give them the tools that they needed. So we spent, up to now, we probably spent close to 100 million making that possible, whether it's on uh, provision of laptops, whether provision of VPN for security purposes, mm -hmm. and, and all the, and the communication tools, whether it's air, uh, bundles so that they can be able to communicate. And currently, as we are leading to, yes, this building, 70% of the people who would have been here are work, are work from home. Right. Only a very, f very few people come to the office. I'm here today because I'm here today. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yes. And uh, does it get a bit lonely sometimes? It's different. Let's say it's different. I yeah. mean, there was always there was always be bustling with noise mm -hmm. and people, mm -hmm. and uh, it was very easy to manage, as they call it, manage by walking around. You want to meet a colleague. Mm. Colleagues would come to see me in the office. Most of our meetings would be in the boardroom. Yeah. That has changed. That has completely changed. Everything now we are doing is uh, most of our meetings are virtual. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so whatever colleagues are, whether it's my executive team, it's all virtual. Whether it's board meetings, mm -hmm. all that is virtual. So it's different. All right. And uh, as we are seeing these as, as we start recovering, it will probably be the new normal. Mm -hmm. Probably the new normal. I don't envisage a situation where people will go back to the way that we, we used to work, that all meetings have to be face-to-face -face and all colleagues have to be in the building at all the times. I think you're going to see a situation where some people will work from home, if they choose to work, uh -huh. or they come to the office, but not every day, okay. not every day, eight to five. I think, I think the world of work, at least for us, is completely going to be changed. All right. Yes. Some say uh, measuring produ productivity might be a challenge. Um, someone is working from home, they have kids they're managing. Um, what do you have to say to this? Not really. I wouldn't agree with that, with, with that premise. I think you're going to start measuring productivity based on the outcomes. Mm -hmm. The days when you, it's not, it's not you, don't, you, you don't want to be able to stand and walk around that, that you're measuring productivity by actually seeing the, the, the people working. I, yeah. think, I think that's now, 
that's gone. Mm -hmm. You it will be on the output. What is expected? Mm -hmm. And there are very many different ways of measuring that. Whether it's uh, <coughs> how many clients you're contacting, mm -hmm. what businesses you're booking, mm -hmm. what service issues you're resolving, that can be measured independently of whether the, somebody's in the office or they are not. Mm -hmm. That's going to be it's going to be very different. You do not have to be seeing an individual to see whether they are working or not. They are not working. So if I get you rightly, sir, are you implying that we are staring at a future where corporates will eventually see the ground and allow more and more of their employees to work from home? I wouldn't say it's the future, it's now. <laughs> there was a time you'd, I would say, yes, that was the future is coming. Right yeah. now it is there. It is COVID there. has brought the future now. The future, it, it accelerated the plans. Mm. I think things like, for instance, uh, when I look at my client engagement during this period, it has increased because I'm able to have virtual meetings. Mm -hmm. Before, it was impossible to, for me to visit three clients in a day in sure. Nairobi, you know, with the Nairobi traffic. Mm. I can do comfortably three meetings with clients in a day because they're all virtual. It's changed. So I think in terms of, there will always be, that is, the future is, the future is here now. We're just now fine-tuning it, seeing what, what are we learning, how do we fine-tune it, how yeah. do we perfect it, how mm -hmm. do we make sure that everybody around is comfortable with it. But I think the, the future is, it's now. It's All here. right. Yes. And uh, Mr. Ngari, let's uh, shift gears a bit now. Of course, uh, the onset of COVID did uh, destabilize quite a number of countries globally, uh, in Africa as well. Economic activity was uh, totally eroded in some economies. And uh, for mm -hmm. Kenya's uh, position, we're looking at an economic growth rate of about 5.6%. At the same time, the number of unemployment has shot up by about 1.7 million people who ended up being jobless owing to COVID. How has the bank been handling this economic situation, considering we, we, you're serving a critical market where if there's a shock in the economy, some people are unable to service their loans, others who had plans to take up their loans uh, shy away because of the uncertainties. Just give us a sense of how the business has been performing. Yeah. You're, you're right. I think in terms of COVID-19, uh, COVID the consequences have been devastating for everyone. I think mm -hmm. there's nobody who can today say I've not, I've not been affected. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly, the global companies have benefited, but that's as it's made. But the vast majority of populations worldwide have been impacted. And, and even, even in, in Kenya, as you mentioned, uh, it's, it's the impact is, is going to be felt long after after we've we've pro, we've come out of it, mm -hmm. and and I think for the for us as a bank the most important thing is to make sure that the bank is strong enough and well capitalized to be able to help the clients go through this because the businesses will need help. Uh, there are businesses who came to us to be for their facilities to be restructured, and we restructured over 22 billion worth of loans uh, mm -hmm. for businesses who came and said, look, I need I need help. And that's always includes individuals because individuals, some lost their jobs completely, but also there are individuals who salaries were cut by 50%, 75%. We've yeah. seen, we saw that. So they also, obviously, if your salary is cut by 50%, you can't meet your obligations. So we had to, to, we had to restructure that as well. So that's how we help the individuals, how we restructure their facilities and help them through this, this process. And the same thing with businesses. And uh, what is also is important for us, as you, as, as, as you saw, we, we went back and changed our dividend policy where we reduced the dividend by 50%. This was all to make sure that our capital position is strong enough mm -hmm. to be able to withstand the post-COVID uh, impact. And it's, it's, it's for us to make sure that we are well capitalized and we are ready to help the businesses recover yeah. and the entire country to recover. That's very, very important for us. Because as a, as a, as a trade bank, uh, we, as a trade bank, they will, when it recovers, businesses will want to trade again. Sure. Whether it's importing raw materials or exporting, and we want to be able to, we want to be ready to be able to do that. That's how we are preparing ourselves. So investing to make sure that capital position is strong, mm -hmm. ensuring that we are protecting our staff so that they are able to continue serving our clients, and then making sure that our positions, we can be able to help the clients that need help. All right. Yes. And uh, talk to us about overall profitability. Definitely, this must have had an impact uh, in your books. Yes, you saw our half-year results. I think if you look at our half-year results, uh, two, 
two things there that were quite important is deposits continue to grow mm -hmm. over t over in double digit about 12 percent growth in deposits which shows the confidence that clients have with us that's very very important mm -hmm. loans also continue to grow i think four four five percent growth in in loans because there are still companies that need facilities around this time mm -hmm. when you think about the companies that are in manufacturing of PPEs mm -hmm. uh, or in their in COVID, they are in they are in the for, uh, in the front line of COVID fight. Yeah. Those are companies we also needed to help. So those facilities are availed to them. Uh, if you look at uh, if you look at our revenue, yes, there's a drop definitely with an economic slowdown. You that that was expected, and profitability overall was down as well year on year compared to the same period, mainly because of taking extra provisions that we must take, which is important to prepare the bank. So you look at the situation and you manage that. So I think we are looking at uh, the bank we are managing well. I think it's important for us as uh, the actions that we are taking to make sure that, that we are looking, we are, we are thinking, we are making sure we are taking care of today, but also most important is asking ourselves about tomorrow. What are the actions that we need to take to continue protecting the bank and to be able to be there to be there for our clients and businesses? All right. And uh, still staying with that, uh, the regulator, the Central Bank of Kenya, did also issue quite a number of uh, guidelines uh, during the COVID uh, season. And uh, this was uh, to cushion the banks. I'd like to just get your uh, overall assessment. How effective was this? Did it have any significant impact? It's been, uh, the regulator has been very supportive and we, we work together because you cannot work in, a, in, a, in isolation and all the measures that uh, the regulator issued at the beginning of the pandemic, we've, very, we've been complying with them and that's, that's really helped. If you take, the, for instance, whether it's on listing of clients who may, not, who may not be able to pay their loans to credit bureaus, complied with that, whether it's on giving relief for mobile payment to encourage digital payments uh, through M-Pesa, mm -hmm. whether it's on uh, the relief measures up to a maximum of 12, 12 months. All this is, we, we work together and it has worked very well and that's, that's why I believe the, the financial sector has been stable the way it has been because it's working in tandem. The regulator has been be able to see what do I need to do, what do I need to protect the industry and we've been working very well to adhere to the regulations that have been issued and the guidelines that have been issued. All right. Yes. And uh, still on the same, um, when you talk about uh, provisioning for loans, um, banks ideally that are not the tier ones like yourself have had a, a difficult run when it comes to building up the capital base. Uh, what has been your experience uh, as a bank? I, I can't talk for others, but obviously for us, is the one, our priority has always been to make sure that we've got strong capital and uh, a very strong capital position. And that's why, as I, as I mentioned earlier, is the first thing that we did was after, when it was quite clear, when we announced our full year 2019 results, mm -hmm. that was 20, that was early March, or is it February? Mm -hmm. we, we didn't the extent of what was coming. But then after it was quite clear for us, we went back and changed our dividend policy to retain a little more money to make sure that our capital position is strong. That to us is, is important, to make sure that we've got a very strong capital position to be able to withstand and be able to take whatever provisions that need to be taken, it's very, very important. Because what's going to, what, if we look at the, as, as you mentioned, the Kenyan economy definitely is going to, it's, it's been impacted. If you look at tourism, which is, yeah. a big, which is a big generator of employment and foreign exchange, it's going to take some time to recover. If you take the, if you take the, the restaurants and bars, it's a big sector of our economy as yeah. well, they're going to take some time to recover. Mm. There are a lot of businesses aligned to those. There are a lot of people who are employed there. So that's going to have an impact. And so it's important for us as a bank to make sure that we have the capital uh, capacity to be able to absorb whatever losses that we need to absorb and continue being there for clients. All right. And uh, Mr. Ngari, uh, various reports have shown also that uh, there are some businesses that might be totally wiped out post-COVID and uh, of course you serve different segments of the society. Um, what lies ahead, especially now that you're seeing economic activities gradually bouncing mm -hmm. back, uh, we're seeing uh, restaurants have been reopened, uh, there's talk of uh, a major conference by the president to also issue the next set of uh, uh, guidelines. Um, what do you see in your crystal ball? I see a different, a very different economy emerging, uh, which is more technology enabled, a, a lot more digital. Uh, when you look at uh, what COVID has taught, if you look at most of the industries that have done, 
reasonably well because you, you, you have to use that term and in this context. Yeah. Uh, the v technology has helped them to do that. If you take, if you take uh, whether you take some, some of the restaurants, take away food, people handling the order that you use your phone or you, then you, uh, that you use to order, whether it's food, books, that has helped. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you take, uh, if you don't have an online presence, you struggle. If if you if your business relied purely on uh, physical contact, you've st those businesses have struggled. But I think the businesses that invested in technology and started doing significantly more business with technology, they've they've, they've managed. When I look at, for instance, for us, when you look at the number of uh, clients who come into our branches, they've significantly reduced. But they have an option. It's not that overall transactions have dropped. Yeah. All the people have done is. I no longer need to go to a branch, withdraw cash, then go and make payments. They're doing it straight out of their phone. So using the uh, digital platform to make the payments. That's, that's, I, those people are unlikely to ever go back to use cash again. All right. And uh, as we come to the tail end of our discussion, I'd like to just pick your mind on what opportunities do you see post-COVID? Um, of course, uh, you've already emphasized the digital footprint is a must in any business of today, but there is the investment cost that comes to this. As a bank, how significantly have you invested in digital? Uh, are you looking to invest more? And if you could give us the numbers. Yes, I think if, in terms of, uh, if you look at, we've been on a two, three year journey in terms of digital investment, and uh, I would bucket it into, for the, retail, for the retail clients. When we started, it was mainly a USSD. That's, that's how you did business with us. But then we have a full digital capability today on our mobile. On, on mobile. And with that, in, that, in, the, in, in the mobile today, you can do almost anything. You can, whether it's to open a new account, you do it digitally. Investments, when you want to do investments, whether it's fixed income, and when I talk about things like treasury bills, you want to buy government bonds, you buy it via your phone. When you want to buy travel insurance, home insurance, you buy it via your, via your phone. If you want, with the, some of the partnership, we've signed up with partners. Mm -hmm. So you want to, uh, for, for health purposes, health insurance, you do it through your phone. We've got over 70 services on mobile phone today. That's the capability that we've built. So we've moved away from a bank being a place you went to, to a place wherever you are. All you needed was, today the only thing you need to do banking with us is bundles or Wi-Fi. That's all you need. That's for the retail client. The same thing for the corporate clients as well. Corporate clients is uh, today, three, two years ago, for any trade products, letters of credit, they're all done manually. Today, over 80% of our letters of credit, LCs, are all done digitally. Today, if you want to do any foreign exchange dealing, you do it digitally. We've connected you, you can be able to deal. And that investment will continue. For us now, the, the phase where we have reached is how do we make it even easier based on the feedback that we're getting from the clients? Yeah. How do we create a better customer experience so that it becomes easier to navigate? That's one. And two is another major investment on cybersecurity because that's, that's, that's the next battle we have to, we have to make sure. I was actually protect. coming to that. Yes, cybersecurity yeah. is another big area that mm. we're investing in in terms of... And we have invested probably in excess of 200 million in that space. And we will continue investing to make sure that we protect our clients. Because it's like w once you've got something new, there'll always be people will try to take advantage. Mm -hmm. That's another area that, that we are putting significant investment to make sure that our clients' data mm -hmm. is protected. Not only the data, but their funds as well. That's right. another area that we, that we are investing in. Mm -hmm. So it's very clear what we need to invest for the client, for the retail clients and the corporate clients as well. And then finally, when we look at uh, lending as well, we're also digitizing that so that when you're dealing with us, probably in, in, in a year or less, you'll hardly deal with any paper for start with Standard Chartered. Whether it's a loan, you do it digitally. Whether it's an account or an investment, you do that digitally. That's the future and that's what we are starting to do now. All right. And uh, I'd like to get your thoughts as well on uh, uh, in the event that Kenya is declared COVID-19 free. Uh, as a bank, what will be literally driving your strategy around investing in small businesses? Because it's an emerging segment that has been underfunded for many years. Uh, how, how are you planning to tap into that sector? As well as uh, reassuring uh, the society that uh, Stanchard, uh, quote unquote, is perceived to be an elitist bank. How do you penetrate the grassroots level? 
I think the, um, I don't know what you mean by elitist, but uh, <laughs> uh, I th w there are two ways mm -hmm. to look at, at uh, our investment in, in the SMEs. Yeah. I think one of the areas that we've, we've, we've considered invested in and, and will be, once, once we are ready, we'll be announcing this, is how do we, how do we start engaging them digitally as well? Yeah. I think for us, is we want to move away from physical engagement, but how do we engage them digitally? So we are looking to see how we can have credit facilities, so digital lending for the, for the, for the small and medium enterprises digitally whatever they'll need to do. That's very, very important. The second part we believe is bringing on partnerships. How do we, how do we bring out partnerships so that we can help the SMEs also become a lot more bankable? Because one of the biggest challenges our SMEs face across, it's not, it's not unique to Kenya, is globally is the, the unbankability, the lack of records, uh, they don't keep records. So once you don't keep records, it's very difficult for the bank to assess you. But how do we help them? And there are some areas, there are some areas we are looking at to see who do we need to partner with so that we can make the SMEs bankable, so that in terms of the, the, their engagement with us, whether it's digital or whatever they are doing, whatever the engagement they are doing is being, there's a footprint that can help them get funding. That's mm -hmm. very, very important. Mm -hmm. And then finally, how do we help them keep, once they keep the proper book of accounts, how do we help them access funding? And at reasonable rates. I think that, that's, that's something very, very important. Our program, for instance, Women in Technology, which we've been investing in the last three years, we have just about launched the fourth cohort, is targeted specifically women who have got technology enabled companies. And when we've seen, when every time we open for, when we, op when we, when we open for people to apply, last year we had over 900 applicants. I would expect that to increase even more this year. And we've looked at a program like that is saying for us very targeted and say how do we help women but also most important how do we help them scale up using technology and so we are looking how we can continue funding them and there's something we'll be announcing how we're going to start funding them as well so that when you come in we are no longer going to look at your history and say you must show us three years of account or you must show us your business for the last three years but how do we take you from where you are mm -hmm. you've applied you've gone through the series with our partnership with Strathmore Business School We've taught you how to manage a business, how to manage funds, how then can we help you? That's how we are looking to partner in the, in the MSME space. All right. Very different approach to help you understand your business, make sure it's bankable, and then technology. We give, uh, how do you use technology to really scale it up? All right. And uh, at this point, I'd like to just get your parting shot uh, in terms of uh, your message to bankers out there and, of course, uh, the customers around how soon do you expect uh, activity to be back to normal? Uh, how is the bank, uh, how, how can, what, what can you say really around what uh, will redefine the bank's next uh, steps in terms of growth and expansion? The, the, for me, the, what I would like to, to say is, look, I think for us is how do we approach a situation where customers feel that we are with them during this time. It's been a tough six months. Uh, when it all started, mid-March, remember that be famous address by the minister, we've had our first COVID case. Mm. All of us thought it's going to be three months. Then we're back to normal. Sure. It's six months and counting. And uh, it it's clearly shows that probably COVID is going to be with us for, from what you're seeing in other yeah. markets, Europe. Yeah. I mean, even China, it's come back in pockets. So for, for us is to make sure that, how do you make sure that we support the clients who are severely impacted to go through this process? How do you help them? Can we be able to assist with the business? I think that's important. How do, you, how do you handhold them to be able to recover their business? If they are not able to recover, how else, what else can we do to help them do something else? Because it's not, it's not the end of the world. How do we help you do something else? That's very, very important. And I think as banks, what is important is at the end of the day, we are the last, uh, the last wall of defense. Businesses, we react to what's happening in the real economy. It's, banks don't lead. You know, it's, the economic activity takes place. Somebody uh, gets extra orders. They want to, or they want to manufacture more items. They, they need money for financing. That's when we come in. There's a trade facility that needs to be, that's, that's when the banks come in. I think it's important for us banks to be prepared to help the recovery. That's right. very, very important. And that's why I, I mentioned that in terms of the capital is very, very important because you don't have strong capital, you can't do this business. You will be, you'll be, you'll not be in there. And that's why if you look at the, the way the sector is approaching, if you look at half year results, most banks normally declare a dividend interim 
I think you've seen that uh, most banks did not do that. We mm. did not declare an interim dividend. Sure. All this is to make sure that we are looking ahead and making sure that we are ready. And uh, when the economy is fully open up, we want to be part of helping the economy to fully open up. Because right. it's, it cannot be opened up fully without the banks. If it's hotels and tourists start coming back, the hotels will need funding to get them back to... Mm. You can imagine if you close for six months to get back that hotel into proper shape. Mm. If it's restaurant, you need to start getting back, that it will require financing. And we will be there. I think that's very important. For us is to tell our clients, we will be there. We will be there to support you. And we so that we recover together. Because when the economy does well, the banks do well. All right. And that's very important. Perfect place to end the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And we hope to be running for a reason anytime very soon once the marathon is back. It will be back. In the meantime, keep practicing. I hope you are. I am. I are am. you running? Yeah. That's very good. Well, that's it for this week's episode of The Trading Bell. We've been coming to you from Westlands here in Nairobi. And a lot lies in the horizon for the banking sector, even as the players hope for better days post-COVID-19. Remember, you can always engage with us on our social media handles appearing at the bottom end of your screen. You can tweet me at Agina Abe, and we'll be able to sample your views, your questions here on The Trading Bell. See you next time. Keep safe. Bye-bye for now.